Good morning and welcome. I am Magdalena Kaiser, Director of Public Relations and also uh, work on delivering education and knowledge on behalf of the VQA Ontario wine industry. I am here to introduce you to an exciting session today that we've put together specifically for the LCBO. Welcome to VQA Chardonnay 1.0. This session is part of a series of 10 webinars we have put together. As you can see, there are five core varieties that we're going to be featuring Chardonnay, Riesling, Pinot Noir, Cabernet Franc, and Gamay Noir. And as you also might notice, we have 1.0 and 2.0 sessions. So we really encourage you to watch both as we will have different hosts taking us through the sessions you will have the opportunity to meet different producers and also get information on special wines that are available at the LCBO in each of those sessions. So these sessions are put together to have you discover the key flavors and characteristics of Ontario Chardonnay in this particular session, the different styles, the occasions that you can taste those wines, and as I said, meet the makers. So next slide, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce to you one of Canada's top wine educators, Peter Bodnerod. He is currently the program coordinator and faculty professor for the wine programs at Niagara College. He will be interviewing six different producers from Ontario that will share their particular stories of their winery, but also the wines that are available at the LCBO and as I mentioned, today is Chardonnay Day. So without further ado, please, Peter, take us to the next steps. Thank you, Magdalena. Happy, happy to be here. Honored, actually, to be here in the company of this esteemed group of uh, history makers, frankly, in the Ontario wine industry. And uh, looking forward to chatting with them, looking forward to tasting their wines and, and telling all of you the great story of Ontario Chardonnay. I thought to kick things off, it might be suitable to uh, have a look at a beautiful Chardonnay vineyard, uh, mid to late summer shot uh, up on the 20 mile bench, just to get you all in the mood for the varietal that we're about to investigate and explore and taste. Before we get to a discussion with our producers, uh, I wanna spend a few minutes just going through some uh, core information about our region, our regions, uh, where these Chardonnays are coming from and, and why there's such uh, unique expressions of this grape, uh, why there's such high quality expressions of this grape variety and, and frankly, uh, such a broad range of styles uh, that suit every taste and budget. Uh, to start with, obviously, we're talking about uh, three primary wine growing appellations in Southern Ontario. As you can see on the map, on the north shore of Lake Ontario, we've got Prince Edward County. Uh, in the, uh, on the north shore of Lake Erie, further south and west, uh, that very long blue section, of course, we're talking about the Lake Erie North Shore uh, Appalachian. And then stuck square in the middle of the two is Niagara Peninsula, which uh, has the benefit of, of being next to both Lake Ontario and Lake Erie, and we'll dig into that a little bit more in a moment to explain why that's uh, such a vital uh, difference maker to the wine growing in this particular appellation. So those are our three primary appellations. Over the years, we, uh, the producers, uh, have worked very hard to figure out what differences exist as we travel from place to place within uh, these primary wine appellations. And as of 2006, uh, we were able to come up with a, uh, a, a set of 10 sub-appellations with a lot of work from Brock University and Dr. Tony Shaw and many others, uh, which really kind of uh, focused in on the unique, distinctive terroirs or natural um, characteristics that existed within each of these 10 sub-appellations. We've got the 10 listed here, uh, and if you've already counted, you'll notice it's in fact 11, uh, because one of these sub-appellations is in fact uh, Pelee Island or South Islands in particular, which is part of the Lake Erie North Shore Appalachian. So um, 10 of the sub-appellations fall under Niagara Peninsula 
and one falls under Lake Erie North Shore. At present time, there isn't a, uh, a VQA subappellation within Prince Edward, Edward County, but I suspect that's just a matter of time. So read these through a little more closely to get a bit more of a sense of how they differ uh, one to the next, um, because frankly, if you're tasting Chardonnay or any great Ontario wine, from different subappellations, you will notice a distinctive difference. Uh, and often it has little to do with the winemaking influence and a lot to do with this specific terroir. Now, if you think that's the smallest appellation that we have in Ontario, of course it isn't. Like many of the great wine producing regions of the world, we uh, celebrate also the single vineyard designated wine. And that's important to take note of. I think when you're buying wines, uh, and you see a single vineyard, you may ask yourself, what does that mean? Uh, why is that important? And I think the fact is that it's coming from obviously an extremely small place relative to uh, our province or our primary appellations. This is one single vineyard that has literally a micro terroir, a, a very, very specific set of uh, climate and soil and uh, various other natural factors and historical human factors that have made this single vineyard what it is. And the expression in the wine that you're gonna get is gonna be consistent and very distinctive to that vineyard. So that's something that uh, it might drive the price up a little bit, but is often worth it. Uh, because you, if you're looking for something quite specific and quite distinctive, maybe a taste that you've had before that you really love, you can go back to these named vineyards on your Ontario Chardonnay labels and uh, you can count on uh, stylistic consistency uh, with subtle variations from vintage to vintage. So what makes wine country Ontario so special, so fantastic, so unique? Three main factors. Um, these are really, this is a, a big part of the essence of our terroir. Uh, this, if you've ever taken a wine class or you've seen a wine map or an introduction to the world of wine, you'll, you'll know we often talk about that band that exists between 30 degrees and 50 degrees north and south of the equator. Uh, and you'll also further note that the vast, vast majority of quality wine producing regions on the planet fall between 30 and 50 degrees. Well, we in Ontario are right in the middle of that band it, between 41 and 44 degrees. And it might surprise you to learn that uh, there are other famous wine producing regions around the world that fall in very similar degrees latitude, namely parts of uh, Northern California, uh, parts of Central and Southern France, uh, parts of Northern and Central Italy, amongst others. Um, that by itself isn't enough to say we should be producing high quality wines or the other factors that come into play to make great wines possible. And the one of the really significant key factors that we have, proprietary factor that we have that makes our place so different from anybody else's are the proximity of the Great Lakes. The aforementioned uh, Great Lakes, specifically Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. And as you can see in this image, they are very deep lakes. And so they do a wonderful job of holding summer heat and conversely, six months later, holding uh, the winter cold. Uh, kind of like a hot water bottle that you put in your bed to keep your feet warm. So if vineyards, our vineyards are quite close to the lakes. And so in the springtime, that bo deep body of water is still holding on to a lot of the cold from the winter. And it delays the, 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 the growth cycle of the vine, which is in the end a very beneficial thing because it, it allows uh, spring and early summer to come on in full earnest. Uh, before the plant, the tender plant starts to grow and could be subjected to uh, frost, damaging frost and other sort of uh, climatic attacks as it were. So the, the Great Lakes really are a, an extraordinary moderating factor. Conversely, in the fall time, our growing season is extended because that, that deep body of water has absorbed the summer heat and is still reflecting that warm summer heat out over the vineyards and allowing the growing season to extend, extend into October and November. And so in the end, we end up having a, a more than adequate growing season for all the varietals we grow. And it's thanks in part to the, the lakes and the role that they play. And the final piece of course is our soil. And our soil is not universally or uniformly limestone, but limestone is 500 million years in the making uh, bedrock subsoil that we have does in fact lay the foundation for many of our vineyards throughout Ontario. 
Uh, there'll be more or less limestone depending where specifically you are in the Niagara, Niagara Peninsula, Prince, uh, Prince Edward County, or Lake Erie North Shore. And the presence of limestone, of course, is a boon to our industry as it is in any other wine producing region that has the benefit of limestone in the soils because limestone equals quality wine. Uh, limestone is arguably the most important soil type for the production of high quality wines and we've got lots of it. What is the world saying about Ontario wines? What is the world saying specifically about Ontario Chardonnay? Well, some of you uh, might know that we've uh, enjoyed 10 years now of the International Cool Climate Chardonnay Celebration. This is an event that was created in Ontario uh, by Ontarian wineries um, to celebrate the fact that while we may be relatively small in the grand scheme of things in the world of wine, we are making world-class Chardonnay and we want the world to come to our doorstep every year, bring their wine with them, bring their winery principles with them and, and share their wines beside our wines with all the Chardonnay uh, lovers uh, that attend. And of course they attend from all over the place. Uh, it's a really wonderful event. With COVID this past year, obviously it made things difficult. So we had a virtual event uh, and four of arguably the world's most important wine critics were able to be a part of that webinar session that we had. And we've decided to just post a few of their um, succinct and celebratory comments that just give you a little bit of a sense of what people who have tasted Chardonnay from all over the world over many decades are saying about the wines that we produce here. After reading these quotes from Andrew and Matt and Karen and Ian, there should be no doubt in your mind that we are producing world-class Chardonnay and everybody knows it. So what do we get from this unique terroir that we have in Southern Ontario? Well, our Chardonnay is not a one trick pony. Uh, to be quite honest with you, while we are developing a regional style and, um, uh, and there is a common theme that, that you might find as you taste Chardonnay from different sub appellations, from different primary appellations from different producers. The fact is that we produce a beautiful broad range of Chardonnay and there really is a style of Chardonnay for everybody out there. But what is it that makes Chardonnay from Ontario, Ontario Chardonnay? And I would say there's a few things. Most importantly, it's the fact that we have this beautiful natural acidity that when well crafted is the most important structural piece in, in this wine. It gives the wine that gorgeous balance, that juiciness, that freshness, that life, uh, but it also gives some of our grander Chardonnays the structure um, to age for 10 or more years and develop tertiary characteristics or additional aromas and flavors. For those of you out there that like to, to age a wine, maybe you have that English taste, as we like to say, the goût anglais, and you like that mature expression of Chardonnay, well, there's nothing stopping you from taking a great bottle of Ontario Chardonnay uh, with its beautiful natural acidity, putting it in your cellar and revisiting it in four or five years and possibly beyond that. Beyond that, I would say that Chardonnay from provincial boundary to provincial boundary has a wonderful expression of fruit concentration. Uh, because of the quality of our soils and the quality of our growing season, we get wonderfully ripe grapes, not overripe grapes like hotter regions of the world and not underripe grapes where you might find they're very green and a little bit uh, sharp. We've got that perfect combination of bright acidity and layers of fruit flavor on top of that, whether that's citrus characteristics, uh, apple, green apple, red delicious apple, maybe it's other tree fruits like pear and possibly even merging into more sort of exotic riper soft flesh tree fruits like peach. Um, frankly, I've had Chardonnays recently, and in fact, some of the wines that we're gonna taste today go even beyond that and might even express something slightly more exotic. Guava uh, is one thing comes to mind, melon. Um, so loads and loads of fruit. And frankly, we're making wine out of grapes. We need to have fruit at the core uh, of the wine and then we layer flavors on top of that. So in the world of Chardonnay, of course, what are the layers? Well, if we have an unknown Chardonnay, then we're celebrating the fruit and the acidity and the natural expression of the grape. 
But Chardonnay is very, very conducive, more than any other grape, uh, white grape on the planet, uh, it would be easy to argue, very conducive to spending time in oak barrels. And um, what does oak do? Well, oak adds a whole other dimension of aroma, a dimension of flavor, and a dimension of texture, in fact, to the wines. That may not be to everybody's taste, uh, but that's the beauty. You try oak Chardonnay, you try un -oak Chardonnay from Ontario, you decide which is it that makes you smile the most, and that's what you can focus on. You can find your happy place and stay there, knowing that there's unlimited choices of very high quality options in Ontario at, frankly, really good prices. So beyond the, the, the flavor, the tasting note, as it were, um, when you go to the LCBO store and you're looking at your options, it's not simply a case of which table, which still table wine should I buy. Yes, oaked or unoaked is an important first decision in that respect. Do I want that emphasis of fruit and acid? Do I want those clove and spice um, and light sort of char, woodsy, savory, warm flavors on top of that fruit? Which is it that I like? Okay, that would be an important decision for you if you're looking at the table wines. But beyond that, Ontario produces world-class sparkling wines. The vast majority of those produced in the traditional method or the same method used in Champagne, where the second fermentation takes place in the actual final bottle that's being sold. Um, and frankly, uh, we do a world, world-class job of it. And I've, I've been in and around the Ontario industry for, well, I'll lie a little bit, a little over 30 years. And, um, you know, the emergence of sparkling wines is, is one of the truly exciting um, uh, experiences and one of the truly exciting developments that I've seen in Ontario. And uh, I'm only one person, but I have to be honest with you, Blanc de Blanc or 100% Chardonnay made in the traditional method is something that uh, we can all uh, really uh, rely on and count on to be as good as anything we can get out there. And frankly, at prices that are a fraction of what you'd pay for some of the more classic uh, regions of the world. As a matter of fact, we just, uh, uh, we just heard about the, the uh, white wine of the year, the red wine of the year, and the sparkling wine of the year. And the sparkling wine of the year uh, was voted to be a Blanc de Blanc, 100% Chardonnay from Henry of Pelham. Congratulations to them. And a consistent, beautiful wine uh, that really shows you um, one of many great examples of, of that style of wine. And then a little less, Often, often we're going to encounter these, these uh, skin fermented wines. So typically white wines would be produced just from the juice without the skin, but there's been a growing trend to sort of revisit a very ancient technique where we ferment the wines on the skins to extract some of the phenolics and the flavors from the skins. These are called commonly orange wines and there's a few producers in Ontario using Chardonnay to, to, uh, to produce that style. And then we also uh, have a number of examples of ice wine made from Chardonnay. So when do we want to enjoy Chardonnay? Well, frankly, as if I haven't made the point clear enough already, any time is a good time for Chardonnay. Uh, I am a little biased. I would argue that, you know, it's my favorite white grape variety, although I never have to make that choice. Nobody's gonna stick me on a desert island and, and demand that I only drink one grape variety. I enjoy them all, but I do love the breadth and depth of Chardonnay choices that we have in Ontario. Um, as we say, if it's oaked, then it's a little, perhaps a little bit more warm and a little more robust in terms of some of its uh, spice and, and, um, and, and, and smoke char notes, although that is typically very, very light on the scale. In something, a case like that, that might be something you think more seriously about your, your menu and you may be looking for a classic pairing like lobster with butter or uh, you know, with Thanksgiving coming just around the corner, that beautiful lightly oak Chardonnay with lots of ripe fruit is a, is a magnificent comparison or pairing with your traditional Thanksgiving meal, whether that's turkey or ham or some other preparation like that. Um, but then we also have those movie nights, you know, or those days with friends or a group of friends are invited over and sure, we can open a great bottle of sparkling uh, Chardonnay from Ontario, but we can also open a, an unoaked Chardonnay, something that's a beautiful aperitif. Again, that natural acidity, just stimulating our appetite, getting us in the mood, getting us excited, and we can build the Chardonnays as the evening goes along. And frankly, uh, I did that just two nights ago. I had a group of friends uh, from the college come over, and I asked them all to bring a wine. I was going to do the cooking, and we ended up uh, with triple cream brie from Quebec, 
and we had uh, we had baguette warmed in the uh, in the in the wood burning pizza oven. We had a couple of different flat you know thin crust pizzas. Uh, we had potato chips on the table, and not surprisingly, my my friends ended up bringing three uh, chardonnays to the to the party. Uh, one going back to 2009 and a couple from more recent vintages. And frankly, it worked. It worked for the conversation. It worked for the, the warm up. It worked for the food. It worked for everything. So it really is a, a great, great variety to pair for many different occasions, many different foods. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the, uh, the important uh, partnership that we have here. And we do such a good job of it in Canada, in Ontario, Chardonnay and cheese. Whether you're a big, uh, a cheddar fan and you know if you are a cheddar fan you know there is not one cheddar there is uh there's ch cheddar uh in the uh in the long package that is very mild etc we may go with a very simple light chardonnay but then we build in terms of age and we get to a three or four year old cheddar and we know the, the robust flavors that are demanding something a little more full-bodied maybe a bigger more powerful chardonnay with a bit of oak can work there but it's not just the, sh the cheddar story Gouda or Chauda, um, uh, smoked uh, cheeses, goat's milk cheeses, traditional creamy bries, the whole range work with, uh, with Chardonnay. And you just kind of spend a little time experimenting with different styles of cheese and different styles of Chardonnay to find the one that works for you. So I hope that you have a little bit of a sense of our story uh, of Ontario Chardonnay, what makes our wines uh, what they are, the fact that we have such a, a wonderful range of, of expressions. Um, and seems like a great segue into meeting uh, some of our producers. Uh, and let's taste some wine, let's taste some actual wines that are in the LCBO that you can enjoy at home and we'll kick things off with Konzelman. So what can I tell you about Konzelman? Well, we have Jim Reschke here. He's going to tell us all about this wonderful wine uh, that he's brought with him. Uh, for me, there's a very strong personal connection to Konzelman. Uh, my my uh, now deceased father-in-law uh, was a huge fan of this winery, and I got a Christmas gift every single year, which was a bottle of the estate pizza. Uh, and I started to count on it every time I went for Christmas. Uh, I, if I didn't get my bottle of Consumant Pinot Noir, then there was something seriously wrong. And uh, I know that's not Chardonnay, and that's maybe not entirely relevant to all of you out there, but the fact is you can develop these personal re relationships with wineries and with wines, and they, they may be the most important part of, of finding a wine that sort of really, um, you know, that, that really resonates with you. It goes beyond what's in the glass, and sometimes it's the personal connection. So Jim, what have you got for us today? Today, tell us all about your un oak chardonnay. Well, good morning, and thank you, Peter. Uh, my name is Jim Rafferty, and I'm the uh, VP of Operations here at Consulin State Winery. Uh, we are a family-owned and operated winery that was founded actually back in Germany back in 1893, and it's really our history and our roots that um, dictate who we are. My father-in-law, Herbert Konzelman who is the uh, fourth generation of family and winemaker who moved the, uh, the winery from Germany here to Niagara back in And when he talks about the reasoning for moving the winery here to um, the lake, it really is the uh, climate, soil, and the proximity to the lake. We're located directly on the uh, south shore of Lake Ontario. And um, he often talks about before he made the decision of coming here, he took half a suitcase of dirt back to Germany with him and had it analyzed and uh, found that the nutrients and the components of the soil were perfect for growing. There wasn't a lot of experience of growing these types of grapes back in those days, um, but he knew that the soil was rich. And Peter, you alluded to, to, to the climate and the proximity to the lake. That's really what drove his decision to, to uh, purchase 40 acres that we have here on the south shores of Ontario. It's proximity to the lake, moderating the temperature. That means warming it in winter and cooling it in the summer, prolonging that growing season. So the wine that we're featuring today is the 2018 unoaked uh, Chardonnay. All of the grapes are sourced 
from the Niagara Lake area. Um, it designated as a Niagara Peninsula wine for people. The harvest dates for this 2018 vintage range from September 24th till October 10th, and that's fairly late. And so on the later side of that, those grapes were harvested uh, we machine harvest, and in total, we harvested just over 71 tons of Chardonnay grapes with average bricks of 20. From those 71 tons, we uh, produced three different styles of Chardonnay. Our unoaked Chardonnay comprises the biggest portion with um, 31,000 liters. This wine has been aged and fermented strictly in stainless steel. It hasn't gone through any malolactic fermentation and its aging potential is around 10 years. So when you taste this wine, it's gonna be crisp and notice some green apple, peach and citrus flavors, which are very typical of a stainless steel um, on oak. In terms of food pairings, an oak Chardonnay is really one of the most versatile food wines out there. It's got enough fruitiness to pair with a wide variety of foods and ranging from appetizers right up to some desserts. Its uh, mouth-watering acidity also is a nice complement and um, you can enjoy this wine with, with cheeses like you said, Peter, um, but for main courses, this wine would pair really well with, with shellfish, even with, with salmon. Um, the acidity can actually cut through some of that fattiness of, of the salmon. Um, you could also pair it with some spicy foods. It has a little bit of sweetness that, that will help with, with um, dishes like Mexican or other spicy dishes. Um, and the acidity helps neutralize a bit. You can also pair this wine with some desserts, um, especially desserts that aren't too sweet, but a little bit more on the fruity side, such as the peach or berry cobbler. So overall, we feel that this wine is a great value. 2018 vintage was a good, good growing year. And as I said, pairs well with many, many different can be enjoyed on. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um... I, I think your notes are spot on. I've tasted them, tasting the wines as, as, we're, as we're talking. And uh, yeah, a really lovely expression uh, on oaked Chardonnay. I mean, a, a beautiful emphasis on, on th those tree fruits. Um, uh, they're so vibrant. The acid is, is not sharp at all. In fact, it's almost invisible, except for the fact your palate feels so wonderfully refreshed and cleansed. Uh, you know, I think sometimes people are a little worried about acid in wines, because acid as a sort of term is something that an amateur may not be already familiar with. And the fact is it's so essential to creating the balance in wines. And here is a perfect example of it where it's just the right amount to create the, the, the roundness, the balance, and deliver the delivery method of all of those flavors uh, that you're getting. Just a quick question. Um, the Lakefront series, where does it fit in the Konzelman sort of hierarchy? It is our main line. Um series uh price range most of those wines in the lake front series around the 15 dollar mark but go up eight dollars um we've got three different tiers so this would be the the entry level the main level tier wonderful so widely available which is great you can fall in love with it you can buy it by the case and know there's going to be more to buy when your cellar is empty that's great jim thank you very much thank you Okay, so next let's uh, move on to Peely Island uh, Winery and we'll talk with Martin in a second. Um, what can I say about Peely Island? Well, my, unfortunately my father-in-law didn't buy me a bottle of Peely Island every Christmas, but uh, it is a, a, an island and a winery I've been to on a couple of occasions, at least a couple of occasions. And what I'll say is it is a unique winery in Ontario, unlike any other, uh, a unique winery in Canada, frankly. The fact that you that you take a boat to get across to the island and then you're on this uh, remarkable uh, microclimate that really nowhere else on the planet has uh, is reason enough to go. But then you arrive and there's this magnificent winery with a wonderful big tasting room. 
uh, a, a gorgeous array of varietals uh, to choose from, uh, from, from very affordable, very accessible to ultra premium uh, age worthy wines. Uh, a very interactive vineyard. Anyway, I could go on and on, but it's certainly a place that I would recommend you go if you haven't, if you haven't been already. Uh, Martin, welcome. Tell us a little bit about the Pelee Island Wine Chardonnay that we have in front of us today. Good morning, Peter. <clears throat> okay, my name is Martin. I'm a winemaker at Pelee Island Winery, and um, I've grown up um, the first some facts about Pelee Island. Like you saw it on the slide, we um, established in 1979. We're located in the western bathen of um, Lake Erie. The winery itself is located in Kingsville, Ontario, but all our vineyards are on Pili Island. The acreage of vineyards are a little bit over 700 acres. Um, what makes um, our situation where we're located so special is um, we are in the middle of Lake Erie. Lake Erie is um, the shallowest lake of the biggest lake. So we have um, probably the mildest and shortest winters and the longest and warmest summers. And um, PD Island itself with its 10,000 acres is um, probably below of the Looks like we might have lost Martin for a moment. Martin, are you still with us? Okay, I think Martin, the connection might be a little bit rough. So maybe what I'll do is I'll move ahead to our next wine and we'll come back to Martin to, to finish the discussion of this bottle, if that's okay with everybody. The joys of technology. Sometimes these things are going to happen and we just have to work our way through them. So next on the list is uh, Artero Wines Canada, which of course is, talk about history in Ontario, uh, by far uh, the, uh, the most historic sort of collection of wineries that we've had in Ontario wine history going back to, well, Mark, Mark was gonna tell us a little bit about that. We're going back to 1874. Um, I think the little tidbit that I particularly like about the history of Artera, uh, and there's many to, to, to look at and celebrate, is the first commercial Chardonnay uh, produced in 1956. I think a lot of people don't realize that Chardonnay was produced by Monsieur de Chonac uh, that long ago, and that that varietal has played such a vital role in, uh, in defining part of uh, who we are in Ontario. Uh, Marco, tell us about the uh, audacity of Thomas G. Bright, and maybe tell us what the G stands for while you're at it. <laughs> well, um, let's talk about, first of all, the story where we came from. Um, back a few years ago, uh, we started looking at somehow how can we really embrace the, the roots, you know, of not just uh, owning, you know, in skilling and working with Jackson Triggs now for the last 15 years, but a little bit go a little bit deeper. As, as you said earlier during your presentation, you know, it's, it's an industry that goes so much and so deep into, into history, right? Um, uh, then Thomas Bright, Thomas Bright obviously is part of where we came from, right? Like, as you mentioned, Altera Canada, since 2016, previously Constellation, then Vincor, and then you go back, you know, to Bright's Wines, and it's amazing, like, you're thinking to, uh, an industry in 1974 they were growing grapes and so that speaks a lot about the legacy and about everything that this industry has, has done as, as i said i've been i've been blessed to, to work in this industry now since 2005 but uh you know when when i sit in you know beside you know <clears throat> founders of this industry it was back in the 70s and even more like you just you just cannot just appreciate how much this industry have come along uh, in the last, in the, it's a short term of years, really, when you think you compare to, to the entire, to the entire world scale, right? How, and it's always being amazed, I always being amazed on how is such a small industry, because when you're looking at the tonnage and looking at the size, it's not really that, that big, but it became worldwide famous, right? In such a short period of time, I remember when I was in Italy doing my uh, sommelier with the Associazione Italiana Sommelier in 1995, 1998, 
uh, Canada was not really much on the map, just a little bit. Then eventually, as the, the years go by, this, there was talking about Chardonnay, Eisman, sorry, Eisman, and then Chardonnay. So that's why we went back a little bit in history, our history, as Artera, or all the names we had in the last 15 years, I should say. But um, definitely, you know, that's, a, that's, a, that's definitely a legacy, a legacy to the, what this industry has done. Um, how does it, uh, Chardonnay, what do we do from, uh, with this Chardonnay? Um, the grapes are coming from two diff different sites. Um, one is from uh, our vineyard in, uh, in Deansville, I found, and the other one is from um, uh, a vineyard that we have in Agron on the Lake, down by the airport, Montague. Uh, why did we pick these two vineyards? Uh, I love the, di the, the, the difference in uh, two main uh, components that I always look uh, forward to in uh, Chardonnay component you mentioned really, really highly in your speech earlier, uh, Peter, which is acidity, right? I like the, the strength, the acidity from the, the Niagara and the lake sites, uh, as well as the minerality and a little bit more, um, a little bit more ripeness uh, from, the, from the parcels that are on the, on the bench. Um, but one thing we decide to do here uh, with the Audacity Chardonnay is, um, as you can tell, there is a little bit of residual sugars there. While we did it like a sous Chardonnay, we start fermenting it, we stopped around a nine alcohol and everything else was residual sugar. I should say probably a small percentage of was in the blend, but that sous reserve, if I can call it a sous, sous sorry, um, a portion obviously deliver a lot of more of that kind of mango, tropical, apple that you can get, whereas the crispiness, the citriness is coming mostly from, I should say, from the two components that are the blend, obviously, from beams with an egg on the lake. Um, uh, did we, we usually pick them separate, uh, ferment them separate, and then we age them in, oak, in two different uh, in separate tanks, sorry, uh, battle groups. And why did we do that is because you never know vintage after vintage how things can evolve within different uh, areas as well as uh, different wines, right? Um, malolactic kicked in um, later on um, in the season for this particular wine. Uh, it didn't start probably, uh, yeah, till probably March. Uh, didn't, sorry, uh, looking at my notes here, sorry, mid-February. Was, all those things make you a little bit nervous, obviously, but it kicked mm -hmm. in and then uh, obviously we um, tried to, to control it with a little bit of least steering um, and just to deliver that yeastiness and that vanilla note from the, from the oak. And the, and the blend, they actually happened really, I should say, probably a few weeks before blending, before bottling, sorry. And that's because, you know, you always go back and forth, is it too sweet, is it too oaky, is it too crispy? And, um, and that's something that I'm really happy that we could share because not only really gives a legacy to the history of this industry that goes back for a long, long, long time, as well as I'm really being, being really proud actually to, to come into a project that I, I never did work too much before in my previous life, which uh, is a sous Chardonnay really. Yeah. Yeah. In, in fact, first time I've encountered it myself and uh, you know, we get so used to going down the same path over and over again, and we kind of create the definition of a bridal in our mind. And so when somebody does something adventurous and creative, uh, there may be a little reluctance at first, uh, but this is, this is just a wonderful, a new expression of this great variety uh, that I think people will, if they, if they taste it, and maybe they've said, I don't know if Chardonnay's my grape they have to try the range and they certainly need to include this in the, in the range of wines they taste. There's something very specific and very unique about this expression that I think a lot of people will like uh, a great deal, as you've described, you know, the, the, the way the fruit is expressed, the way the, the vanillin and light sort of caramel notes of the oak are ingrained. Uh, it just has this lovely sort of voluptuousness and the sugar is really nicely managed. It doesn't feel the least overly sweet. Um, and we've talked a lot about food and wine pairing, and I, I would imagine that you've, you've just expanded the horizon of food possibilities because of the way you approach this wine. Yeah, I tried it actually with uh, uh, salmon not long ago, but um, um, it was um, um, Atlantic salmon, and uh, I marinated a little bit. I mean, I'm not a foodie. I'm not, sorry, I'm not a good chef, so I may probably have killed. But um, we did a very good marinated with a little bit of... Um, uh, brown sugar and honey and, uh, oh, and some spices and you know that 
I smoke detection and a smoker. And, you know, and, and it goes back to what you just said and or earlier, it's just the, the variety, the, the, the range of the spectrum that then of Chardonnay and the Chardonnay qualities, styles that we have within the region. It just gives you just so much room for imagination. And even if you are an expert chef, or just a, an amateurial chef like I'm trying to be, um, but it really gives you, you know, the sky, the sky is your limit when it comes to this kind of thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, your, your company um, epitomizes the, the whole story of uh, experimentation and growth and looking at things from different angles. And uh, thank goodness that we've had Artera as part of our history because Ontario simply wouldn't be the same without it. So, Thank you very much, uh, Marco. You, On to our next wine. And uh, we've got the Cave Spring Vineyard Chardonnay, which, uh, hey, guess what? I'm excited to try this one too. I'm excited to try them all. Uh, Cave Spring, I mean, what can you say about these guys? You know, uh, uh, if you've been to the town of Jordan, then you're missing out on one of the truly great uh, uh, wine villages experiences uh, in the world. And uh, it's, due in great part to the work of the Penichetti family and their entire team uh, that have made, uh, you know, the whole wine visiting experience something entirely different. Um, um, you know, uh, I think for me, when I think of Cave Spring, I think it's, it's all said in the name, you know. Uh, it, it's such a terroir driven uh, group of wines. The, the emphasis on place has always been so important to this, to this company. Uh, and I think they really capture the essence of place in, in every varietal that they grow and every, uh, in every wine they make. So uh, with that in mind, let's welcome Gabe uh, DeMarco to the discussion and have him tell us about the Cave Spring Vineyard Chardonnay. Hello. Hey, Gabe. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Great, thanks. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, this wine uh, it really, um, for us, defines kind of the the starting point for our story of Chardonnay. Uh, it is classified as VQA Niagara Peninsula, but it comes from two sub-appellations. It is from the Beamsville Bench and Lincoln Lakeshore. Uh, you can see the sub-appellation map on the screen. It's just, uh, just north of us, uh, closer to the lake, uh, which really uh, for us is where we source uh, almost entirely the fruit for all our wines, uh, mostly from the Beamsville Bench and then supplemented from the Lincoln Lakeshore. Um, and so why that's so great for this wine is, uh, is that it, you get the tension, uh, the mouthfeel that, that kind of, um, that, that comes from the limestone benchlands, and then you get that really nice, fresh, uh, lively, bright fruit uh, from uh, the soils and being so close to the lake from Lincoln Lakeshore. So I'd mention, uh, like you mentioned, Peter, uh, the group of, of us, uh, which I'm honored to be a part of, uh, History Makers, uh, I merely am in the shadow of history makers. I am honored uh, and, and fortunate to be uh, trusted with uh, carrying on uh, the tradition of Cave Spring. Uh, obviously working uh, still very closely with Angelo Pavan, the founding partner. Uh, but uh, Cave Spring uh, is, has been and still is uh, a family owned and operated uh, estate winery. Uh, majority of our vineyards are located uh, on the Beansville bench. We have 150, 160 acres uh, on the Beansville bench. 135 of those are contiguous. One beautiful stretch of land that is at the physical base of the Niagara Escarpment. Uh, so standing in the vineyard together, we would, uh, you know, looking north, we would see the Great Lakes, about three and a half kilometers in the distance, and the city of Toronto on the other side of Lake Ontario. And then if we turn south together, you would see uh, the beautiful wall of the Niagara Escarpment uh, and the reason why we have the hawk on our label actually is because uh, the hawks, the goshawks, uh, the, the red tail hawks, they actually ride the thermal updrifts off the lake. So the, the, the winds will come in off the lake and create those moderating effects that we've discussed already. Uh, they'll hit the escarpment and they'll cycle back and they create a beautiful uh, like thermal uplift <laughs> and, uh, and the hawks ride those. So we, that's why the hawk has always been on the Cave Spring label. Uh, like you also mentioned, uh, place terroir. Those wines are wines from uh, the, the kind of the, the entry Chardonnay all the way to the CSV Chardonnay or the Cave Spring Vineyard Chardonnay. Uh, all um, really the, the focus on these wines is emphasis of place, uh, terroir, what that brings to the grapes, and therefore we can we can bring to the wine. Uh, and so, um, 
the history and story of Cape Spring uh, speaks for itself, I think, at this point. I'm just uh, really honored to be part of that part of that tradition. Um, the the wine itself is 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 kind of built to be something that is approachable by the glass, uh, but also serious uh, enough and has enough weight to kind of carry and and, and match with food. Um, so this wine is um, majority stainless steel fermented, uh, although there's a component done in barrel, barrel fermented aged. It really is kind of all neutral oak, but it is done uh, to bring some texture to the wine, uh, kind of harmonize that acidity, kind of uh, focus the, you know, focus that tension from the bench uh, to really give a nice mouthfeel. You know, I would uh, I'd love, you know, I do, and I drink this wine at home all the time. I you know, pair it with, you know, grilled chicken, uh, you know, grilled portobello mushrooms, Mm. Uh, you know, it's something, anything grilled, seafood, uh, pear is lovely, uh, soft cheese. Um, but it's just, um, just a really nice drinking approachable Chardonnay. And you can see, um, uh, the alcohol is 13%. So you, you, you get that, the kind of the ripe fruit from the bench, kind of opulent style, even for the, at the entry level that it is because, uh, because of the origin of our fruit kind of being sourced from our estate vineyards. Um, so I think that kind of sums it up in terms of um, kind of the origin of Cape Spring, uh, our kind of our, our grounding in history, uh, and then also uh, just the, this the kind of what we're looking to do with the, the Chardonnay. Yeah, well, thanks, thanks for that. I, you know, we, one of the things that we want people to take away from these sessions is is a, a real desire to come up and visit these wineries and see for their for their for themselves you know just how magnificent our terroir is and how, how spectacular frankly even as a tourist it, it is a place to visit you know um and i think you've got maybe a lot of people uh, making plans already with but if i can mention we have a tasting room now actually in the vineyard so you can come up cave spring road and uh, taste wines in the heart of the uh, the actual vineyards now which is something that we're quite excited about yeah fantastic and yeah, that's something we're all excited about <laughs> Thanks, Gabe. Really Thank you very much. That summary, and it's been a pleasure to enjoy the wine as you were talking. All right, so uh, we'll move on to our fifth wine, and we've got uh, the iconic Chateau de Charme winery. Uh, for those of you that you have made it to Niagara, uh, as you're driving along York Road, maybe on your way to uh, Niagara-on-the-Lake, or perhaps you're going to stop in St. David's or Virgil along the way, you can't miss this spectacular winery. Uh, it truly is a chateau um, with a, the most magnificent entranceway, surrounded by uh, the gorgeously manicured estate vineyards on both sides. Um, and uh, frankly, another one of our iconic producers that, you know, without whom the Bosque family and all the work that they've done, uh, VQA might not look the way it does, uh, and, the, and the, the story of quality wine in Ontario might not look the way it does. They've certainly played a very vital role in all of that. So I'm very happy to welcome Paul Bosque to the discussion now to tell us a little bit about the barrel fermented Chardonnay. Paul, welcome. Thank you, Peter. Ah, uh, shucks uh, for that introduction. Uh, uh, you know, in your uh, introduction, you mentioned that, um, You've been at this in our industry for around 30, uh, 30 years. And uh, I think there's been a few times in your 30, 30 years where, you know, me and you have had the opportunity to, to work, uh, to work to, together as ambassadors on behalf of this industry. It's been a little while, uh, but here we go yet uh, one more time again, eh, Peter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't have it any other way. Um, uh, I'd, uh, uh, there's been a number of, references up to this uh, uh, point that sort of have triggered some uh, reaction or some memories uh, in, in me. One was the, uh, uh, you know, the acknowledgement of um, uh, Adamar de Schonac at Bryce uh, Wines producing the first Chardonnay uh, in, uh, in Ontario, if not uh, Canada. And uh, when my family arrived from uh, France in the 1960s and I was a very little kid, but uh, my father, Paul uh, uh, Sr., who, you know, uh, was the winemaker at uh, Chateau Gay Wines, uh, the newly minted winemaker, uh, became fast friends with uh, Adamar de, de Schonac. And, um, and the generational difference was quite pronounced. I think they were a good 30 years uh, apart. But I can remember in the, in the 60s and 70s uh, spending uh, 
many, many, many afternoons uh, in uh, Monsieur de Chonac's uh, living room or in his backyard. Bored out of my mind, quite frankly, because I couldn't figure out what uh, him and my father were uh, were, were talking uh, were talking about. But uh, he was uh, he was uploading to uh, to to my father, who was in his early 30s uh, at that time, uh, an extor extraordinary amount of uh, of information. And uh, not that um, not that my father didn't you know come well equipped already. Uh, you know, he went to the University of Burgundy uh, in the 1950s, and that's where he was first exposed, you know, to the great white grape of Burgundy, which is uh, Chardonnay. So uh, there was no doubt in his mind when um, he started uh, Chateau de Charmes in 1978 that uh, Chardonnay was, uh, was crucial to our plants going, uh, going forward. And uh, we planted uh, quite a bit of it in our original uh, Creek Road uh, uh, vineyard. And it remains our number one planted uh, varietal to this day, more than 40 years uh, later. Uh, this particular wine, the barrel fermented Chardonnay, LCBO number 81653, I, I, I believe if you go into the, uh, the LCBO uh, database, uh, I think there's a it puts on there, uh, you know, when a wine uh, first made it onto the general list. And uh, I think there's a date on there from the early 1980s, like 1982 or 1983. This wine has been continuously listed by the LCBO for almost 40 years, and um, which predates it becoming an official VQA wine because the VQA system didn't come in until the 1988 uh, uh, vintage. So um, if this is not, you know, the oldest standing, you know, VQA wine at the LCBO, uh, uh, it's got to be uh, one of the two or three um, uh, or originals. It has, to, it has to be. It's been around for a long, long time. As I said, it predated the, the VQA, the VQA uh, uh, system. Um, the draw attention to the label, perhaps. Uh, one hundred percent estate grown and bottled, and the appellation is the collective Niagara on the Lake appellation, VQA Niagara on the Lake, and uh, so this wine is the grapes are sourced from uh, four different uh, vineyards all of which we own and operate. We're 100% uh, estate. We don't uh, purchase any, any fruit. Not, nothing wrong with purchasing fruit. Uh, but you know, we have uh, 250 um, acres of, uh, of, our own, of our own vineyards, which keep us uh, plenty, uh, plenty busy. And um, uh, those four vineyards are located in two distinct uh, sub-appellations. Uh, the St. David's Bench Vineyard, which is the home of, of the Chateau and across the road, the Paul Bosque Estate Vineyard, those are located in the uh, St. David's Bench uh, sub-appellation. And our original vineyard, uh, the Creek Road Vineyard, uh, founded in 1978, as well as our seven and seven vineyard, uh, are found in the aptly named uh, Four Mile Creek uh, sub-appellation. Uh, sub so as a result, it carries the collective uh, sub-appellation, Niagara, Niagara on the Lake. Um, the, we haven't planted a, uh, a new block of Chardonnay since the late nineties. So if you ask me about, uh, vine age, I can, uh, tell you that, um, uh, the, uh, youngest, uh, vines, uh, that, um, uh, uh, go into this uh, into this wine are about 21 or 22 years of age, with the uh, the oldest uh, going back to uh, 1983, and in fact, our Paul Bosque Estate uh, Vineyard, which uh, I personally uh, planted when I was uh, still a university student back uh, back then. Uh, that's still original vines at that uh, at that site. So this is a wine from vines that are 22 to 37 uh, years uh, years of age. Um, uh, 
uh, in terms of the production of the, uh, of the, of the wine, I think what's uh, particularly interesting is uh, 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 a very careful selection of uh, yeasts that are sourced from, uh, from, uh, from Burgundy. Um, my, uh, my, my father, who uh, uh, is now 85, is uh, still more involved than you know, people might, uh, might think, and he is a tremendous mentor to our winemaker, Amelie Bourri, who like, like my father, uh, was educated and trained uh, in, um, in our native uh, France. Um, in 2016, we made a significant investment in casks. Yeah, these are 5,000 liter uh, casks. Uh, we purchased a total of 16 of them, half of them, uh, eight, uh, are used for the fermentation and aging of, uh, of Chardonnay, including, uh, including this, uh, this, this wine. Um, uh, what one should expect uh, here, I'm, I'm glad that Peter placed great emphasis on um, limestone in his introduction. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, bench, uh, bench vineyards, St. David's Bench uh, vineyards have a lot of limestone in the soil because of our uh, immediate proximity to the, uh, to the escarpment. And that imparts the minerality that uh, is clearly apparent uh, here. Um, uh, other uh, aromas and flavors, uh, you know, some of the usual uh, suspects, melon, pear, um, popcorn, uh, popcorn butter is one I, I like to draw attention to. And that comes from uh, the, the judicious use of, uh, of uh, oak, uh, oak aging, the wine is, uh, is uh, aged in uh, in cask for about uh, for about nine uh, nine months. Uh, finally, in terms of a uh, food uh, food pairing, um, this might not sound too fancy, but uh, how's about a Caesar salad uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, crumbled with? Uh, well, um, so uh, you take uh, prosciutto uh, produce by my very good friend and neighbor, literally uh, uh, my neighbor here in St. David's, uh, Mario Penge. Uh, you take his, uh, his incredible prosciutto and you, uh, you heat it in the oven and uh, get it out of there and crumble, crumble that when it's um, uh, still very, very warm into a Caesar, uh, Caesar salad. Uh, put in lots of creamy, uh, creamy dressing, which will uh, complement uh, the wine extremely, uh, extremely well, and um, uh, this might be the uh, the style of wine that kicks off a uh, a fun, uh, a fun, a fun evening. Uh, everything about it is is about being in, in in balance. We don't want anything in particular to leap out. We certainly don't want it to be, uh, you know, too uh, too too oaky, and it's not, or too acidic, no. and it's certainly not. Uh, it's all about the uh, the balance and the integration uh, in the uh, in the in the in the glass, and um, you know this is um, the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree for my for my family. Uh, you know uh, uh, this is how you know we learned it all the way back in uh, in, in Burgundy when when my dad first learned how to produce white wine from uh, this uh, great great grain. Wonderful, Paul. Thank you for that uh, that excellent uh, and thorough discussion of the wine and your fantastic family uh, and your and your uh, and your business, frankly. And I have had Caesar salad and Chardonnay just like this, and you're darn right; it's a beautiful, a beautiful pairing. Um, let's move on to uh, our our sixth and final uh, presenter. Uh, we are going to be visiting yet another of, of the truly historic wineries in Ontario. Uh, and maybe, and I won't say more than any other, uh, out of the interest of not offending any, but if you, if you think of family and you think of Ontario wineries, there aren't too many others uh, where, where it's so, so clear and so important of the role that family plays in a successful operation. Uh, and that, of course, is the Henry of Pelham Family Estate Winery with their wonderful history and the three guiding lights of the operation now, uh, with all due respect to everybody on the team, you know, the three Speck brothers who make this thing happen. So 
really happy to have uh, one of those three Speck brothers with us to introduce us to the Speck brothers family tree, the goat lo lady Chardonnay. Daniel, nice to have you on board. Thanks, Peter. You're very kind. I wouldn't say the three dim lights leading the business, but <laughs> we'll, we'll take anything we can get. And uh, we've, we've had a, you know, a fun time uh, exploring our family stories through wine over these many years. Henry of Pelham, of course, talking about you know the, our ancestors to settle this land, or Cuvée Catherine, which you referenced earlier for winning the award with the, the Blanc de Blanc Chardonnay. Thank you for that, for the uh, sparkling wine, Henry's wife being Catherine. And this is a, a, a sort of, it's been a pet project of ours for a few years, these Speck Brothers wines, uh, especially under the family tree uh, portfolio. And we like to say that with, with the family tree wines, uh, we're celebrating our shady roots and, and in each, each of these wines tells a, you know, kind of a ridiculous story, a true story, whether it's the bootlegger Baco Noir that's just uh, launching with the Chardonnay at the same time in the, in the LCBO, or the Padre, which tells a ridiculous story about my father, which you can look up online, I'll leave it at that. Um, uh, the Goat Lady uh, was, a, was a real person. She, was, uh, she lived across the street from the winery when my brothers and I were just really young kids literally I was eight years old and my oldest brother Paul there's three of us uh, Paul would have been 16 and we had a couple of cocker spaniels uh, three shovels and a lot of vines to plant and we started putting vines in on the on the property and the goat lady we called her the goat lady we didn't even know her name uh, it was actually Marion but uh, Marion lived across the street she kept goats and she started feeding our dog uh, fresh warm bowls of goat's milk and he had hay fever and for her a cure for everything was goat's milk. So she'd wash his eyes clear with goat's milk and, you know, Boswell was his name. Uh, Boswell, our Cocker Spaniel, you know, less and less did he ever come home. She was feeding him whole roasts. I, frankly, I think I was a bit jealous and I was hoping that I would get taken in by Marion, but it never happened. And she uh, basically, uh, I'd say kidnapped our dog, but I think he was a bit, a bit of a Benedict Arnold and abandoned us. So uh, years later, uh, as we were making this, this wine and, and playing with a, a new style for us and maybe pushing the boundaries a little bit with, with what's going on in Chardonnay and Niagara. Um, we thought about that story because uh, her house, which was actually our great grandmother's house, it's still there, uh, is right next to a vineyard, a Chardonnay vineyard that we planted in the, uh, oh God, what did we plant? I think it was in the, in the early 90s, actually before that, late, I know, early 90s, in the early 90s we planted it. And so it kind of gave inspiration to, to what this wine was. And, and what I think made it kind of interesting is that the, this wine is, uh, uh, we're really pushing ripeness and richness to kind of hit that, that buttery tropical style. I, I like what you said earlier about uh, guava and melon, you're, you're speaking generally, but I think this wine is, is going in that, that direction. It's a, it's a rich, opulent style. It's a bit of a departure from the, the Chardonnay we typically make, and I think what you commonly we'll see in Niagara, which is that sort of uh, uh, crisp, appley, very fresh style, which I quite love. Uh, but this is something different. It's a little more, a little more new worldy, maybe a little more uh, what we see from some of the, uh, the riper climates in, 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 in the new world wine uh, regions, which, which is something that we've, we've taken a lot of effort to, to, you know, try and harness here because we do have a nice warm growing season, especially at the early, early part of it. And so for the, for the harvest, we can, we can let this wine, you know, go a little further with Chardonnay. I mean, and uh, I think I think it's a, it's a fun style. It's very. If, if I was thinking, you know, about food matching and, and all the rest of it, and you can go on almost indefinitely with with food and wine matching, and I love to do that. But I think of this wine for myself as kind of a cocktail. I found, you know, all, we just launched it, and all summer long, it's been the the, the wine we've been drinking by the pool. It's, it's the, uh, you know, it's five o'clock. Uh, open a bottle of the Goat Lady, and, and uh, by 5.15, it's open the second bottle. So it's, it's kind of like that for me. Awesome. Well, I must be honest, I was, uh, I was very excited to see this new line uh, from the Family Tree. I've been a big fan of these wines for quite some time. Uh, I've always been a fan, uh, and we won't talk about these in these sessions, but I've always been a fan of what we can do in Ontario with blends. And, uh, you know, certainly, Historically, uh, recent history, perhaps uh, one of the best values and most interesting and uh, and most expressive blends 
that was you know really accessible to a lot of people were the were the early renditions of the family tree wines which i continue to love and a really interesting mix of varietals in there as well so to go varietally like this and have such great stories connected and to push the boundaries again a little bit and give ontario consumers yet another amazing option uh, from henry palom well done good decision you see the dim lights are actually <laughs> the way they should thanks very much dan thanks peter okay. So we've had a little time to go through the six. Uh, as you will recall, unfortunately, uh, as much as we love the terroir of, of the South Island, sometimes the Wi-Fi signal may be affected. Uh, so we're gonna take uh, just a minute or two to go back to Martin, and I hope we have Martin on the line. I'm just gonna go back to uh, the very, uh, this, there we are. We were talking about Peely Island and we lost Martin. And Martin, I hope you're back and you can take a minute or two just to tell us a little bit more about this wine, uh, pick up where you left off perhaps, um, so that we have the complete picture of Ontario Chardonnay today. So for, sorry for that when we got disconnected. Um, I think where we cut off was um, some small fun facts about uh, wineries on the island. Like um, I think I started in 1865. There was the first commercial winery on the island, Wind Villa. In 1819, um, we had in Ontario um, 41 wineries. From this 41 wineries, there was 23 on the island. Um, then prohibition started, um, it was 1916 to 1927. Um, we still produced wine on the island and, and uh, the island itself was a nice smuggling point towards to the States. And um, about after prohibition, um, tobacco took a little bit over and um, it stopped um, growing wines on the island. So the last winery um, closed in 1951, the doors. And then um, 1979, we started to grow grapes there and started with the winemaking there. So um, <laughs> Um, we are, what we are presenting here is our um, 2018 Chardonnay unoaked. So the wine itself um, have 12.5% alcohol, the sugar level is um, 5.8, and the acidity um, we have um, 7.1 grams per liter. Um, it was harvested in the last weeks in September towards to the um, first week in October. The bricks level where we received in nine, 2018, the Chardonnays was between 19.5 to up to 23 bricks. Basically, it's, everything is machine harvest there. Um, the harvester itself have a distemma on it. Um, the sugar level, like I said, uh, 19.5 to 23 and um, the tonnage roughly um, what we get is 2.5 tons on an acre um, mm -hmm. the total acreage on the island what we have in mind is um, 700 acres and roughly around 100 acres of that is chardonnay um, this particular chardonnay is um, stainless steel fermented um, what it makes a little bit unique is um, the part went through malolactic. I think a lot of other wines are doing that too, but also a part we left from Sir Lee. So when you try the wine itself, um, it's totally stainless steel fermented, but even in the nose, you get a little bit butteriness in the nose and it's, we believe it, it comes from the uh, leaving it on the Sir Lee. Um, in my opinion, it's um, a typical Chardonnay, um, have a little bit zesty acidity on the finish. It is pears, like I said, um, or people said before, um, good with Caesar salad or generally salad. It goes, you can go through the whole palate, like um, it goes good with fish, it goes good with poultry, it goes good with white meats. And even when you, I have it often with um, fruity pastry. And obviously, yes, cheese is not wrong at all. Wonderful. Well, I'm glad to taste it and, uh, and I'm re really finding it uh, a, a very sort of um, honest expression of all of the things that you've just talked about. And that makes me very excited to, to understand what's gone into growing the grapes, 
what's the, the, the various techniques that were used to finish the wine and then to see those inputs expressed as outputs. You know, uh, the, the texture that we're getting from that little bit of Lee's aging, the, still the, the brightness and freshness of acidity, the fact that you're harvesting grapes at different bricks levels so that we do get some of the green apple, but we also start to get a little bit of the exotic riper fruit expression as well. Um, lovely complexity, beautiful balance, a really excellent food wine, I'm sure, and extraordinary value. And so happy that we were able to include this one as well in, uh, in our tasting today. So thanks for coming back to us, Martin. And uh, You're more than welcome. See you again soon. Okay. Buddy, so I'm going to just wrap it up now. We'll skip forward to uh, the end of our presentation. And I will welcome back um, Magdalena Kaiser to take us home. Great. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, what an amazing hour that we've had. And thank you so much to the six producers. Thankfully, we had uh, worked through the little uh, technology issues that always happen in these times, uh, but a great session. Uh, I also wanted to take the opportunity to thank the LCBO staff for taking the time to watch this session today. Uh, you, are, uh, you have a superior commitment to education, knowledge, and service, and it's really important to Ontario producers to have this strong partnership with you. Um, just a, key, a few key facts to remember that we want to leave with you today. Uh, VQA equals certified 100% Ontario grown. And so it's, you know, it's, it's a reflection of other certification components, but that's the key message that we want people from Ontario to really understand. And that is more important than ever, especially in today's environment where local is becoming increasingly important for Ontario uh, residents. And what we'd also like to remind people is that because of the local nature of Ontario wine, it's the most sustainable choice really for people in Ontario. Uh, it also uh, can be reflected uh, with respect to the economic impact that it provides to Ontarians with 18,000 $18, jobs, also $98.20 per bottle that it's putting back into the economy. And then finally, what is really important is for people to remember that Ontario uh, wine, VQA wine, the value proposition is really, uh, is undeniable, it's amazing. International visitors continually comment on the value of our wines. And when consumers taste our wines blind, it's an unexpected, surprise for them, which is wonderful, that our wines uh, are, are truly comparable to anywhere on the globe. And next, I, before we, I guess the last slide, Peter, if you don't mind just putting uh, this last piece up, is a last thank you from Doug Beatty, our Ontario VQA Wine Ambassador. He has met many of the uh, LCBO staff in person over the last several years. And unfortunately, that's more difficult these days and so, but he's always available by phone or by his email, Doug, uh, that you can see on this uh, PowerPoint slide. So please reach out to him with any questions about today's session, about the wineries, the wines. And so thank you again and cheers to Chardonnay today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.